amazing job Ali until that last statement. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, good morning. How are you guys doing? It is amazing the pastors and the leaders you have here at this church. Um, it is quite a great blessing. And I've uh, pastored for years in a lot of churches, and not this quality happens very often. And we are excited about what God's doing and building this next building. And uh, so this is your chance to write a, a prayer or desire, and uh, and. It will be memorialized from here forward. So this week we're laying the foundation of the new building. Is that amazing or what? Wow. And uh, so this is a exciting time for the church and how God's going to use and bless and, and what a great tool it is for the future in that. So um, Wednesday night. We are in Revelation chapter 19 and heading to the end. It's just, uh, it's just beautiful, beautiful chapters of um, God giving us a clear vision of Himself and of the, uh, of the future. And uh, you know, when will we be by this these chapters again? Not for the years and years. So I would uh, encourage you to come out. There's a blessing study in Revelation, but also there's it's just so healing. To, to get our eyes on the Lord. Now, as we're teaching through Revelation, people often ask me, hey, Brian, where, where is hell actually at? Is it like in a different space, in the center of the earth? And uh, I've actually changed my theology on that lately here. And that is wherever hell is, its opening is in Red Bluff here. <laughs> because it is as hot as, and uh, and now with the fires coming out, it's like, wow, I, I don't know where it is, but it's the open door, beginning, where it is, is here. <laughs> uh, no, it's been a blessing being here. I grew up in, a, in the valley, and it's good to be back and to be a part of what God's doing here. Well, I, I tried to get some notes printed out for you. If you got uh, a set of notes, if you don't, you can raise your hand, and uh, the ushers will get your notes. We, so, anybody needs notes? Raise your hand right here. Once again, everybody donating ten thousand dollars to the building fund. Keep your hand up. <laughs> so, right here, ushers, we can get them. The other way is, um, yep, we got them all of you. And uh, the other way is, um, it'll be up on the church app coming up in the next week or so, but you can go to my app, go to the app store in your cell phone, type in Brian Newberry, my Words of Encouragement app will come up, and just hit Notes, and uh, you'll see the Notes button, and it'll have the notes of today's sermons and Wednesday night's sermon. But uh, we're not going to always print them up, but I just want to give you an idea if you do um, go to the app, and like I said, it'll be on the church app here quickly. Um, you, you can see it's helpful. And there's a lot more in the notes than I will be sharing, but it's there to, uh, you know, study at home and look along. And, and there's one more right over here. And another one here. And another one here. I'll see your hands. Okay. Let's turn to James 4. Lord, we come before you now, and we know that we are so often weak and weary and numb and even hard-hearted. But we're here, Lord. We ask for grace and mercy right now to whatever it takes to break through, and let us hear what your Spirit is saying to the church this morning through these passages in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Now, we had ended in chapter 3 with some incredibly beautiful verses. And um, where he talks about the wisdom from beneath, and then also the wisdom from above. And he, and he says it's gentle and peaceable, and it's full of good fruits, and willing to yield. And, and he just said, man, the, when people are walking in the Spirit, and 
and, and people are walking in the obedience of Christ. And, and it, it just starts with peace. It ends with peace. And what good fruit is just able to come from that atmosphere, that place where we're just walking in that wisdom from above. Oh, we'd like to stay there. But James switches gears. In James chapter 4, verse 1, he says, But for you guys, <laughs> where do the wars and the fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covenant cannot obtain. You fight and war that you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. Listen to this last phrase of verse 3. It's a key. That you may spend it on your pleasures. Is this familiar to you? It would be very familiar to the early church. I believe this is a reference to the prodigal son. Where he got his bag of money to head out to spend it upon his pleasures. And so James says here, um, man, the, the church fellowship is not a place of sowing peace and living in peace. Rather, it's, it's a war zone. And why is this happening that people are, are so at each other and, and causing such hurt and difficulty in the church. I, I love the way J. Vernon McGee used to say it. To live above with the saints we love, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints I know, that's another story. <laughs> Where does these wars and, 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 and this fighting and this lack of peace come from. He says, it's because of this thing happening inside you. There's this lust, this, this, this desire for pleasures and the wars inside you and it's showing up on the outside towards others. And so we picture that home of the prodigal son. And boy, what a war zone that was for quite some time. Why? Because the father wasn't a good father? Well, I think the prodigal son thought so. I think he thought the beautiful, wonderful house that had been provided was a prison to him. It was a place of being constrained. It was a place of... of hardship and he wasn't going to be at peace he wasn't going to have real joy and happiness until he got out of there but it was in him right it, it really wasn't about his home or his dad or the country it was he had this desire to be satisfied and and yes it wasn't going to happen in a godly home Teenagers, talking about a war zone. Those wonderful little kids, you know, I remember my daughter's like, oh, daddy, you know, she's a little girl. Can I marry you? And I go, oh, yes, I think you can marry me when you get older. Me, you, and mom forever. This will be wonderful. And then you just sort of weep, thinking one day they're going to leave. And then they get to that age, and you understand something in nature on the natural, on the nature channel. You say, why would those mean birds kick their little babies out of the nest? I know. I know. There's wars, fightings. It's a natural desire to want to kick them out. And believe me, they want to go equally as bad. But I, I think about this here. And parents often say, yeah, I just... My teenager, it's just like I'm a wall and they just pat me you up, know, throwing their body up against it, trying to knock the wall down. It's like, yeah, that's exactly what it's like. And everything in me just wants to step aside and say, do it. I'm tired of getting wounded and beat up and hurt and 
I'm trying to stand here because you're not six years old and you get a little scratch on your knee with a Band-Aid. The decisions you're making now are going to affect you the rest of your life. And yes, I am constraining, not you, I'm constraining your passions and desires. I'm, I understand you have impulses that you think will bring you joy and freedom. They're going to bring hurt and sorrow. And understand, life can be brutal. You're going to reap what you've sown. But that day comes, doesn't it? Where you have to step aside. And I can imagine the father here with such a broken heart when he realizes he can no longer fight this strong impulses of his son, thinking that there's a greater place of pleasure than at home, thinking that there's greater reward in the flesh than in the spirit, thinking that true peace won't come until he has unbridled freedom. Boy, we learn, don't we? Freedom is not being able to do whatever you want. Freedom comes when you're able to do all the right stuff consistently and it's not a burden to you. Some guy wins $5 million and so he goes and buys all the alcohol he can to fill up that barn. And he says, now I don't need to work and I can drink all I want every day, every night. Well, how long is this going to last, do you think? See, freedom's not being able to do whatever you want as much as you want. Freedom's being able to have restraint and do what's right for your body, for your family, for your community, for your country. And you joyfully do it, even though it's hard on you to keep doing that. But of the broken heart, and probably tears coming down his eyes as the father starts turning the combination on that safe. Because the son came to the place going, I just, I've got to get out of here. I can't wait till you die, Dad. Give me the inheritance. I understand. You are equal in power to God in this one thing, your free will. And not God and all the holy angels will hold you back when you say, my will be done, and I will not bend my knee to any other than my own desires. I think of those children of Israel. When God was giving them food from heaven itself, all they had to do was walk out and pick it up. And they came to that place in their desire saying, I'm sick of this manna. We want meat. And God starts a south wind blowing and all these quail came in and they could just grab them. And they tried to cook them, but they couldn't wait. They just started eating them while they were still uncooked. And it says in Psalms 106, it says there that they had this deep desire um, that we wanted to be fulfilled to get their flesh. But then there was a leanness in their soul after they got that flesh. And so the day comes where the father has to step aside and no longer be the wall, and the prodigal son takes off to go to another country and with his bag full of money. And he says again in verse 2, You lust and do not have, you murder and covet, cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Notice here, he doesn't say, look, you're no longer even praying. He doesn't say that at all. He says your prayer life isn't what it used to be, but you're still praying. Remember in 2 Timothy 3, one of the signs of the last days is not men leave the church and become a bunch of atheists. Quite the opposite. Religion increases. And it says they all have a form of godliness with no real power. And this guy here as well, he was praying, but it was like, God, give me my desires. Give me my, whatever it is, 
money, opportunities to, to, to please my flesh and live for the, the goals of the satisfaction of what earth can bring. And, and the Bible makes it clear. Prayer is never a means by which to accomplish our will. Jesus taught us to pray. And as you pray, you say, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. In 1 John it says, when we pray according to His will, He hears us. And we're, then we can be confident that what we pray will have. When we pray according to God's will, we're just a wait to see that mountain move and be cast into the sea. God wants us to have a tremendous confidence in Him. But it's when we're coming and praying things that are according to His will. But how many things could be prayed for and received, but we don't ever receive them because we don't think to ask. Our heart's not in that place of, of prayer as it should be. I love this prayer of a Civil War soldier. A guy found this writing next to a dead Civil War soldier. And it says this, I ask God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for help that I might do great things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything that I had hoped for, almost in spite of myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. And I am among all men most richly blessed. I love that where we can come and we can ask whatever we want, but with that heart of saying, I want your best, God, not my best. I want your plan, your desires, not mine. Here's how I see it. But boy, I, I, I'm definitely saying, don't give me exactly what I'm asking for. I, I'm attempting to communicate, but give me what it is that you want me to have, and nothing more and nothing less. Well, James now is this Old Testament fiery prophet, blunt, not worried about offending, not worried about the sensitive or those who want to come to church and hear only politically correct statements. James says it the way it is. And let's not forget, this is coming from God. The Holy Spirit is the author of these words. But there in James 4, verse 4, he says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Boy, this is a clear Old Testament reference. Do you remember the beginning of James? This half-brother of our Lord according to the flesh who grew up in the house with Jesus. Himself a very much a non-believer throughout Jesus' ministry. But after his resurrection, he did become a believer. But yet, he is called not to just pastor a church, but he's called to be a speaker, an apostle, a prophet to the Jewish church scattered throughout the world and how well they would know these many many references a matter of fact there's a whole book of the bible about this the book of hosea where god says i'm your husband you are my wife and i, I wish that your heart towards me was the same as my heart towards you. And you might remember that story in Hosea. This prophet was commanded to marry a prostitute, Gomer. I don't know which was worse. She was a prophet, or she was a prostitute, her name was Gomer. Um, oh, hi there, you know, 
Hosea? So I go, okay. Anyway, these are second service tired things going on here. You guys, you guys are in the, in the loop here. But anyway, they get married. She goes out prostituting again. She gets pregnant several times. And Hosea says, hey, I'm putting her right now. And God said, no. Go speak lovingly to her. Bring her back to yourself. Do whatever it takes to make this marriage work. And she has several kids from different Johns. And finally, God says, now go prophesy. Israel, this is you. You are prostituting yourself and, and worshiping other gods and following the dictates of your heart. Repent, or you're going to reap what you sow, and I don't want that to happen. Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 17 to 19, Brothers, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I told you often and now tell you weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Listen to this description. Whose end is their destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Wow. Wow. Here we, we realize that we also, as the New Testament church, are engaged to be the, the bride of Christ in His second coming. And so it's a very much an exact parallel. Not in adultery, as in the Old Testament, but He is saying here that we are being, making ourselves impure and not preparing ourselves for that married supper of the Lamb to be the bride of Christ. And so from a New Testament perspective, it's identical to the Old Testament. Get this adulterous, fornicating heart out. And the reason this is happening is because your friendship with the world is pulling you away further and further from the Lord. In James chapter 4, verse 5, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. Now in our English mindset, the word jealous is only in a negative context. But this is in a positive context. And in essence, God is saying, don't you know of God's incredible, passionate, loving desire for you? This is also an entire book in the Bible called the Song of Solomon. And there Solomon is talking about the passion and desire he has for his wife and how he wants to bring her to himself and, and, and have this intimate time with her and how he needs her to prepare herself as well to come and, and, and experience all the food he's prepared and all the oils he's brought and all the perfumes that she would be there. And, and he's having to seek her out and try to find her. And he's going door to door and saying, hey, have you seen her? Where is she at? And then he finds her. And then the story changes where now she's seeking him out. She's trying to find the one she loves. She's starting to say, come away, my love, my fair one. Come and drink up the love that I have for you. And, and then he says, ah, you know, yes, you are my love, my fair one. I delight in you. And she says, yes, I delight in you. And there's this beautiful scene of just intense passion, emotionally and physically, for each other, and it's beautiful. I don't, I don't know if there's really anything more beautiful on earth than that, where two people have a single heart towards their spouse, and they're not, they're not have a wondering eye or a fanciful heart that, that there's only one that they desire, and there's only one that will satisfy, and that's the only one that they want. And that is how God is towards us. God desires you with an everlasting desire. 
God wants us in a way that we can never even know what it means to want and to desire. And he says here, don't you understand? Interesting. The children of Israel come out of Egypt. And remember, they almost know nothing about God. As a matter of fact, Moses knows very little about God at this point. But one of the first things that God reveals to them is this heart. In Exodus 34, verse 11 through 14, he said, hey guys, just so you know, one day you're going to get to the promised land. I'm driving out all these pagan people. And he said, when you come into that land and, and, and you're looking at all of the paganism there and all their riches there, he says in Exodus 34, 12, take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land that you're going, lest you, there be a snare in your midst, but what does he say, verse 13? But destroy all their altars, break down their pillars, cut down their wooden images. Why? Because you need a single heart towards one God. Why? For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. One of the names of God is I am jealous. I am single-hearted towards you. You alone are my bride. There is not no other. You alone are the people of the earth. I am your God and you are my people. Above all the peoples on the earth, you are my treasure. And I desire you to have that same longing for me and me only. Well, in chapter 4, verse 6, he gives more grace. Therefore, he said, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So, yes, your heart is divided. Yes, you're seeking after the pleasures of the world rather than the pleasures of God. You're trying to satisfy yourself in that which can't satisfy. The flesh can never satisfy. They asked Rockefeller, you know, how, how much money does a man have to have to be rich? And he said a little bit more. But yet the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. But those who desire to be rich, who are trying to satisfy themselves with something that can't satisfy, he says they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. They drown themselves in many hurtful lusts. These are all things that, that can't, can't satisfy. So he says, look, I love you. I'm single towards you. And you need my grace. But unless you are willing to put up outside that stubborn, hard, rebellious heart, I, I can't get to you. That prodigal son had his bag of money, went to a country, didn't know anybody. Nobody knew him. He didn't have social constraints of people going, oh, isn't that so-and-so son? What's he doing to that girl today and that girl tomorrow? What's he going with it? Where is he spending that money? He went away and nobody knew him. He had a bag full of money, so he had a bag full of friends. But what would happen? Things started to fall apart. Things started to sour. But yet, guess what? He stayed in that foreign country. It's getting worse. He's going to stay there. It's at the point now he is starving and he has no food and no money. I'm still going to stay here. I'll go get a job as a Jew, lowest as you can go, feeding pigs. And even when he was craving the food that the pigs were eating, he still had a stubborn, proud heart. And how the father just had so much grace to pour upon him. But it would have been like water off a duck's back. God could have poured all the blessings, all the love, all the goodness. Could have taken him into a land flowing with milk and honey. And it cannot satisfy such a heart that's set on trying to insatiate himself with the pleasures of this world. He's going to say in verse 10, the answer is humble yourself in the sight of the Lord that he can lift you up. You know what? Just, just stop. Stop it. God's ready to pour it upon you. 
In verse 7, he gives now a further instruction. Submit to God. A full yielded heart. Your will be done. Your ways be done. You've made me. You've got a purpose. And I submit to live for your purposes, God. And then he gives a little end note. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Now understand, these verses are not about spiritual attack. These 12 verses are about a person in a weakened condition, not because Satan is attacking them, but because they're trying to live a life after the flesh. But what happens when the wolf sees a wounded, weak sheep away from the flock by itself? He's like, oh, I'm not going to miss out on this one. So Satan is, is a, a, a roaring lion. He, he is always looking. And believe me, when he hears about that wounded sheep, boom, he's dropping whatever he's doing, and he's going after the easy pickets. And so that which has been made bad by the weak flesh is now going to be made worse, compounded by attack of the devil, causing that which could have been wounded to even be destroyed. This is the way Satan works. He's always looking for opportunities, opportune times. But that can go away if you listen to the voice of your father, your husband, the one who loves you so much, Look, I'm right here with a giant bucket of grace to dump it upon you, but I can't reach you in that foreign country. And I can't reach you while you've got that shell around you of stubbornness and bitterness and hard-heartedness and, and, and you thinking that there, there's better pleasures than in your father's house. Even if you were standing right here, it would just dump on you while you're in this shell. So you've got to have a broken heart, get rid of that shell, and come in a place where I can dump it upon you. And in verse 8 and 9, so now he gets further instruction. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Oh, I love going to church. Such a comforting place. <laughs> Boy. Things are serious, aren't they? This is a real world. And, and, and the fact is, is things can be real good or they can be real bad. And even if you have all the money and all the pleasures of the world and you do not have a peace with God, it's real bad. How many famous millionaires that the world loved them committed suicide this last year? Sort of almost epidemic proportions, huh? It's sort of a wake-up call of all of us going, fame, fortune. Oh, just if I had this much money in the bank that I could be at peace. Oh, you know, no. It's about a peace with God. And he is saying, guys, you can't live without this. I just told you, draw near to God, but I am telling you, draw, draw near to God. And if you come with the whole heart, you've got to hate this. You've got to come to your senses like the, the prodigal where he's there going, do I, do I push that pig out of the way and... and Chance getting bit by that pig to grab that slop and eat it. And finally, I mean, there was just no lower for this guy to go. If this didn't wake him up, nothing was going to wake him up. But he finally hit Bob and he, he came to his senses. And he said, as bad as I've been, as rebellious as I've been, as rude as I've been, I know my Father would receive me back. 
And I think at that point he got up out of that slop and he's like, ah, it's my like pig. I'm going to get this stuff off me. I want to take a bath, but I can't. I can't wash the pig out of the clothes, but God help me. When he's tattered and bruised and barely with what energy he has trying to make himself back to his father's house, there's nothing funny about this. And it's not going to, in time, be something that's going to be funny later. In 30 years from now, we'll laugh about it. No, no. We're never laughing about this. This was tragic. You've got wounds that happened to you in that foreign country that can never be erased. Maybe diseases. Man. Here he is now, and, and he is saying, there's got to be a complete brokenness. There's got to be a place where you come to say, I hate my sin. I hate the flesh. I, I want to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. I want to come to the place that I, I realize that it's only a life in the spirit that gives life. Anything after the flesh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring hurt, a broken relationship with God. And it's going to bring a <laughs> destructive relationship on others. That heart has to be broken, that God can do a new work of grace. And here he says, he came to his senses. And now he comes with a full heart. Boy, the Bible says so much about this. If you'll seek him with all your heart, he'll allow you to find him. Jeremiah 29 11 through 14, we know those passages. He says there, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you shall call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you shall seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. So there's this place where you, you, you realize, man, the world and its pleasures are, they have nothing to add to me. It's in my father's house. And of course, he didn't really know his father as well as he thought. Because he thought, man, my father is so gracious, he would receive me back. Done deal. And, and all, all I, you know, I, I think that his heart would be open to a point to make me the lowest servant in the house, living out in the barn, until the day I die, I don't have to worry about a place to stay or food anymore. That's as far as he could imagine this grace that God wants to pour upon him. But boy, he had no idea once he would humble himself. Notice verse 10. If you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, what will happen? He will lift you up. How high? To full restoration. So the father evidently made it a habit it was a part of his daily routine to look down that road towards the country where his son had gone and, and just hope and long with a broken heart, praying constantly. And one day, he sees the shadowy figure in the distance and he, he knows that profile. And as the sun starts coming towards him, he can tell it. With the look on his face, he can tell it in his eyes. There has been a full brokenness, a full repentance. And, and the son has practiced this speech repeatedly and tries to get it out. I've sinned against you. I love you. Just make me a servant. And the, and the father never lets him finish his speech. He doesn't say, well, we'll give it a try. We'll put you on probation. What does he do? The ring on the finger, the coat of many colors probably, sandals upon the feet. And the father says, oh, this is a time for celebration. My son who is dead is alive. My son who was lost is found. Get the whole city together. We're going to have a party tonight. Full joy, full fellowship, full restoration, a giant party of just saying it's 100% restored. 
That's, that's the, who our God is. That's the way He is. And how He learned this. What a powerful message. However, guys, there's another side to this coin. Yes, we've learned. Why is there wars and contentions? Why are people getting upset and, 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 and causing fractions in the church? And it's because we're fleshly. We're not walking humbly. There's areas of our life that are not submitted to God. And, and, and if we did have that, we would be at peace with one another. You're walking in fleshly wisdom that's not from above, but from beneath. And it's causing this confusion and this anxiety and, and this hurt. It's always going to be this way, guys. I, I, I hate to tell you, but church is not a refuge. Heaven is a refuge. Matter of fact, often church is the front lines of the battle. I mean, I, I don't know what the demons of Red Bluff are doing this morning. I don't know what their plan has been given by their commander. But I'm pretty sure about 100% of all the demons are in the churches today, right? Trying to mess with people on their way to church, getting them frustrated and angry and slapping at the kids and arguing about whatever. And so the time you get here, you're so flustered, you can't calm yourself down. And he'll do the same thing on the way home. He wants to steal those seeds that have been planted in your heart so you don't grow. I've had relatives that one day just said, i got to start going to church. They didn't realize they need to get born again, but I'll start going to church. And they do get saved. But, you know, I'm the pastor guy. I'm not really close to him, but they call me up going, man, you know, I want the church done, and this guy hates that guy, and that guy's mad at that guy, and that guy's gossiping about that guy, and man, I mean, it's just like, ah, uh, this is not much different than the Kiwanis Club, you know, <laughs> or my bowling league. I, I thought church would be different. And it's like, man, there's just... Everybody's in a different place in their pilgrimage with the Lord. And the fact is, is there's still a lot of Christians that are weak in their faith, that are carnal in their heart. And, and, and so people are people. I, I hate to say that Christianity doesn't take the humanity away from us. Then on top of that, you got the devil poking at everything, trying to stir it up and make it worse. Well, this is why I wish I was back in the New Testament church. Boy, I read the book of Acts. Hey, guys, this book is written, they estimate, 45 A.D., which would be about 12 years after the resurrection. <laughs> this was the early church. They were struggling just like we all struggle today and will struggle forever. So one part of the reason is, is just... People are in the flesh, and, and, and they're, they're coming to the church and spiritualizing it, and they're weak in their faith, and they got a form of godliness without power, and, and they're causing, trying to cause you, they don't realize that the devil's using this whole thing to, to get you in the flesh to react in a fleshly manner. But there's another side of the coin. And we see that in verse 11 here. The older brother. Do not speak evil of one another, brother. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Why is there also strife? It's because of self-righteousness and a critical, fault-finding, judgmental attitude. You, you see, understand this. The younger son obviously was not in tune with the Father's will. They were not on the same page. Finally, he left in disgust and anger with his back full of money. It was obvious that he was not in harmony with this household. But you got the older brother. Boy, he looks the part. He's doing everything right. He's, he's right on cue. And it wasn't until this situation that He's really revealed how out of tune he is with the Father. Humility, guys, is not acting all like, oh, I'm so humble. It's honestly appraising yourself accurately. 
But what's this older brother say? I've always been faithful in your house. I've never done anything wrong. I've been perfectly obedient my entire life. This is what he basically says. It's like, are you kidding me? And then he, we see the bitterness equally in his heart. You've never said to me, son, go get your friends and I'll throw the biggest party for you because you've been such a faithful, wonderful son. Not one time have you ever invited my friends over here and have me a party, ever. We see this bitterness. We see this envy. And then we are really revealed. His heart is greedy. I'm not going to share the inheritance with that guy. He got his inheritance. You know, I'm not going to... Uh, it's not going to cut into my action. So evidently, when that prodigal son left, the older son was smiling and, ha, 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 it's all mine now when dad dies. And now that the brother showed back up, oh, he's cutting into my Well, I don't want that to happen. Why also is there wars and fights amongst this self-righteousness? Critical spirit. Fault-finding attitude, a heart of condemning one another. What's the answer to that in verse 12? There's one lawgiver who's able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Guys, understand, to judge this moment, according to God's way of thinking, you've got to know everything about that. From the day they were born. You look at a person and you make a judgment and you get a new piece of information, and you're going, oh, that was a little harsh, I guess. After all, not knowing, now that I know a little more about the circumstances, I realize. Think of that story of a couple of moms who are watching their kids at track. And uh, they're going, look at that guy. Billy out there, man, he shouldn't be on this team. He can't even make it around one time around the track. He has to sit down and take a rest. And then another mom shows up and says, oh, man, look at Billy. He's doing so good. It's hard to imagine he was in such a serious car accident eight months ago. And here he is. They said he would never walk, and he's out there. Look at that. Almost able to run a whole lap now. Isn't that amazing? So good that he's still on the team and being a part of the team. So good for him and everybody else. Oh, what do you think of those two moms thought of? You see, we don't know. We don't know the environment they were raised, good or bad. We don't know that they, they, they had information or lack of information. They might have been raised in a, a, a life in childhood where they were always worried and and fretting and hurt, and there was never a positive information to guide their lives. And then they get into their junior and high school years, and there's not one voice to, to overshadow the voices of the world and their friends and the anger and the frustration, and, and, and they are just sort of a product of, of just absence of direction in their life. And now here they are in this moment. Can you judge that? No, you can't. Our heart should just always be to say, judge God whenever you want in your time. And as for me, I'm just going to love them. I'm going to receive them. I'm going to just say, forgive me. Well, what are you going to say forgive me for? I don't know. They're, they're hurt. They're upset. They're, they're poking and prodding and cutting. And I just want to grab them and hug them until that knife drops out of their hand. That's the father, isn't it? And he goes to the older brother and he begs him, please change your heart. Please set aside those thoughts and those attitudes. I love you. Yes, you've been great being steady and, and being here, and you didn't take a bag of money and run off to a foreign country, but then the son reveals how wicked his heart is. Well, that son of yours took a bag of money and spent it all on harlots. How would the older brother know that? He didn't. He just knew what he would do with a bag full of money in a foreign country. 
You see, he was equally as wicked. He was equally as rebellious. He was equally as unsubmitted. Even though he had a form of godliness, there was no heart of being in tune with the Father, walking in the will of the Father. And now it's been revealed when he has to show mercy and forgiveness. He can't change his heart. He now needs to repent. He now needs to fall on that rock, or that rock is going to fall on him. He needs to now come and say, God, Father, help me. I, I believe and help my unbelief. I know I should be forgiving, but I'm so critical. I know I should be rejoicing that my brother is dead, is now alive, but I just hate his guts and wish he was still gone. Oh, my heart, so desperately, deceitfully wicked. Who can know it, God? Heal me. Here he, he makes it clear. Guys, you've got to let go of all of that stuff. Notice what he says in verse 12. Who is able to save? Vain is the help of man. God alone can save us. He saves us. As a matter of fact, the Bible uses that word not only on the day of being born again, but he repeats it, that if you obey God and follow this way, Timothy, if you hold good doctrine, you will save not only yourself, but those who hear you. And this sinful, wicked body, it's just a constant thing, isn't it? Every day, we've got to deny ourselves. Take up that cross, beat our body in subjection, crucify our flesh with his passions and desires, and take the time to say, God, I give you this day. Help me, Lord. You alone can save. Of myself, no good fruit will come. I can exist and I can build stuff and I can sell stuff and I can buy stuff, but I cannot bear fruit of any spiritual degree. And the Spirit is what's life. This earth is going to pass away with all its pleasures and desires. But those who do the will of God will last forever, and that fruit will remain forever. God, save me this day. Give me a humble heart. Give me a loving heart. Help me to put to death that critical, fault-finding, judgmental, self-righteous, legalistic attitude. God, please, rip from me the desires of my flesh and screams. I want... The glory of this world and the glory of heaven, but I know it can't happen. I know I want a palace now and a palace in heaven, but I know such a thing exists for very, very few. My desires lust for more than your Bible says is right. How wretched man I am, the things I don't want to do, I do the things I do want to do, I don't do. How wretched man I am, who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to Christ Jesus, my Lord. Where sin abounds, His grace abounds more. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There is one who is saved. Let's get our eyes up on Him. Let's come back to Him. All of us, in some degree, are at that place. What did He say in verse 10? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Guys, you can do this or God will do it for you. <laughs> but it's going to happen. Don't make God humble you. And don't sit here today and say, boy, I wish so-and-so was here. They really need this message. <laughs> no, humble yourself. You, you can't help anybody else, guys. I, I wish we could. I wish my wife's beautiful, righteous spirit could change mine. <laughs> Of course, I used to say my righteous spirit would help my kids. Now they're much more righteous than I am. They walk with the Lord much closer than I, I do. I'm ashamed. But we can't. It's, it's like following Christ is like going up a, a, a hill full of sand. and you're, It takes everything you have. Both hands. You slip and it's sliding, crawling inch by inch. And you'd like to be able to reach back and grab your wife or your kids or your parents. But all you'll do is pull yourself down. 
and not move them an inch. We, we can't. I can't humble anybody else. But I can humble myself. And guys, nothing good's going to happen until you're walking in that broken and contrite heart of humility. Put away the fleshliness. God, help me. I crave, I lust, I desire, and it's breaking my relationship with you. My heart's hard. I used to be able to pray, but I don't anymore. I used to love the Bible, but I, I not like anymore. It's just not interesting to me anymore. I, I, I force myself to go to church. I, I force myself to try to walk and follow you, but it's burden is so great. Yes, your heart's delighted. You, you, you can't love God and love the world. You hate the one and cling to the one, other, you despise the one and love the other. You can't do it, it won't work. There comes that place where you've got to cry out, Lord, I don't want to be the fleshly person. I don't want to be the self-righteous person. This is just ending my relationship with you breaking it, keeping me out of harmony with you, and it's disturbing and hurting everybody around me. Give me that single heart. I want to end this morning with one passage in Isaiah 1, verse 18 to 20. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. If you're willing, God will cleanse you, make you as white as snow. But if you're unwilling, if you refuse, then you're going to suffer the consequences because there is one who can save but it also says in James, verse 12, there is one and one alone who can destroy. And so we come to that place right now to say, Lord, search my heart. Lord, see if there be any wicked way in me. Yes, Lord, I hear that. There's some lust, some fantasy going on that's dragging me hardening my heart towards my spouse, causing me like not to desire that which is pure, but desiring that which is impure. Lord, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, there's an anger, a bitterness going on. I, I realize it's a cancer that I cannot control. But I, I, yes, Lord, I, I repent. I'm identifying it. Lord, cleanse me, heal me, forgive me. Lord, right now, search your heart. See if there be any self-righteous, self-seeking, legalistic, condemning attitude in us. And fill us up with your love. If there's any here today that have not received the Lord, right now just cry out, God, forgive me. Just like the prodigal son, he, he hears your heart, he sees your repentive attitude, just in the secret place of your heart, in the meditations of your mind, just say, God, cleanse me, forgive me. I'll tell you what, he died paying the penalty of your sins. He rose again conquering your sins. So he can now give you the free gift of eternal life and cleanse you and just say, yes, Lord, I want that. And now he just says, follow me, that's it. Grab, get a Bible, start in the Gospel of Matthew, and just read right through and tell somebody else so they can help guide you along the way. But it's just that simple, begin following Jesus. Thank you for the washing of the water of your word this morning. In Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and close with the song.